Hello, this is BSJ, and this is going to be my next video for my tips and tricks course. And in this video, we're going to be talking about how to properly run a dual offlane. So in this meta currently, dual offlanes are very popular. In the future, maybe with different patches, that may change. But this is something that will apply in any meta where a dual offlane is important to use, or just when you decide to dual offlane in general. So the first things first is the idea of the purpose of a dual offlane. So what a dual offlane does is it creates a lot of pressure on the safe lane carry of the enemy team. And it also is meant to enable your offlaner in a lane that they otherwise wouldn't be enabled. So what I mean by that is if your offlaner would be one against two and just get zoned by the support while the carry farms, a dual offlane can make it so that now that no longer happens. Or maybe you're against three heroes and the secondary hero in the dual offlane simply makes it such that you don't die. Like maybe they're just meant to protect you. Heroes in the four positions such as Clockwork, or sometimes you even see Rubik's, or these type of heroes are really nice for protecting their offlaner because of their skill set. Rubik can lift the supports away, Clockwork can cogs defensively, these type of things. So different supports serve different purposes in a dual offlane. But the main purpose of the dual offlane, and this is what I really want you to understand, is to secure your offlaner a game. And because the offlaner is traditionally a solo offlane role, a lot of people don't realize as a support in a dual offlane that your goal as a support above anything else is to stay in the offlane as short a time as possible. And the reason why I say that is because after all said and done, when you are supporting your offlaner, you're not supporting your mid or safe laner. Now that may seem obvious, but what I've noticed about a lot of supports in my pubs, I don't know about lower rank pubs, but if it's happening in the top 500 rank, it has to be happening in lower pubs, is that they think a dual offlane means that they should just be in my lane, maybe even up to 10 minutes. And that is not what your offlaner wants. Your goal as a support in the four position, or even five, depending on which one's dual offlaning, is to make your offlaner independent as soon as possible. So that can come down to what level your offlaner is independent, that can come down to like maybe your offlaner has a slight level advantage over these enemy safe laner making them independent, or that can simply mean there's nothing for you to do anymore. And what I mean by that is sometimes at a certain point in the lane, once this enemy supports have like level three, it doesn't matter that you're there, you're just going to feed or not help anyway. And at that point, even if your offlane is not quote unquote independent, you should just leave. So my goal for you as the four position is to understand when you should leave. And my goal in this video is to also talk about the perspective of the offlaner, making sure you pick the proper lanes and enable yourself to have the most successful dual offlane as possible. So with that introductory being said, I'm pulling up this pub as an example, where I'm an Omni Knight and a Leshrac. So most times, there are exceptions. The idea of a dual offlane is that one hero is meant to body, zone, protect, while the other hero farms, harasses, or offers threat. The exceptions to this are like when you have a Spirit Breaker Darkseer. What I mean by that is usually these combinations are like one melee, one range where the melee hero stands in front while the ranged hero offers threat from behind. The idea of this is that you have one tanky type hero that protects the other hero, and that other hero serves some type of threat and harass and pressure. So last thing you want to do if your offlaner picks Wind Ranger is pick something like a four position Dark Willow that can't protect each other. There are a few exceptions where if they can't close the gap on you, two ranged heroes can be okay. But if they're able to just run at you in a lane, that oftentimes can be very vulnerable. And if you have two melee heroes, sometimes they can just kill you if they have some way to threaten or punish the fact that you have two melee heroes. So I'm not saying never pick two range, never pick two melee, but the general idea is you want one hero to distract and harass while the other hero farms. And one of them serves as a shield for the other, where in this case, as an Omni Knight Leshrac against Lycan, Marana, Shadow Shaman, I'm the farming shield type hero on the Omni Knight, while the Leshrac is this like threatening, harassing ranged hero 
that you kind of protect each other because if they try to go on me, they're gonna try to t they're gonna take a lot of harass and damage from the Leshrac, and I'm hard to bring down. But if they go on the Leshrac, if he positions properly, they should have to go through me first, making it so that they'll like get hit by me, take a heal bomb nuke by me the entire time. So it's not only important that we have the right dual composition. And this is decided, by the way, by the person that picks second. So if he picks Leshrac and then I just pick some ranged squishy hero like Batrider or something like that, I don't really like that combination all that much, simply because you kind of just get ran at in the early levels. But maybe something like that could work if the enemy team can't punish it. I'm just bringing up to you that I picked Omni Knight second when he picked Leshrac first because I thought the combination would be quite good against the composition of the enemy's safe lane. And that's something you can kind of get used to over time, learning these matchups, learning these compositions. But so I'm going to go ahead and point out crucial mistakes that my Leshrac makes in terms of positioning. Because we talked about that I'm the shield and farming hero, while he's this harassing, damaging hero. So mistake number one. The idea of a dual offlane when you have this shield damage combination is recognizing that where the shield should be and where the damage should be. And what I mean by that is, if you put the damage squishy hero in the most threatened position, like they are out of position in a space where they could easily die, and then the shield is not between them and the enemy, that's a problem. So if I look at the enemy lane, trust me this will be different in every single lane. If I look at the enemy lane, what's it going to look like when they try to kill us? Where are they going to come from? What are their supports going to be doing? And the answer is simple. It looks like a Shadow Shaman looping around from the right side, shackling one of us, followed up by an arrow, and then they hit us. So the idea with this, in my eyes, is in an ideal situation, I'm going to get shackled, Leshrac's going to stun the Shadow Shaman, and we're going to be fine, preventing the shackle leading into the arrow. This will apply differently in every single lane, but it's best, if, especially if you're practicing this with a friend, that you talk about what can go wrong in this lane as a dual offlane. How are you going to die? What's it look like? What's the enemy's counterplay to whatever lane you're doing? And so, one thing I had a problem with if you watch this game live, is that my Leshrac insisted on sitting on the right side of the lane, in the jungle area over here when the only way someone's gonna die is if Shadow Shaman loops around to the right, shackles him, he gets arrowed, and then he gets hit to death. And this is something where, as odd as it sounds, it's gonna change the lane if I'm here, where I'm standing in a spot shielding him, but I'm within a creep wave. Why is it important that I'm within a creep wave? Because if I get shackled and I don't get arrowed to follow up, I don't care that I, don't, that I get shackled. So I just have to be near creeps. And then he should be behind me based on where the threat is coming from, which, as we mentioned, is over here. So if he's standing over here while I'm farming, that's the perfect combination of what this lane should look like. As you'll see it later, I actually direct him to do that and it works out. But there's a few times that he's going to stand on the right side of the lane, and this is going to happen. That should never happen in this lane. If you look at their lane, that's clearly how he's gonna die. He needs to be standing on the left side while I'm standing in the creep wave. So this type of shielding and damage dealing can look different in every single lane. Meaning, if they don't have such a high threatening lane, maybe he can be standing over here anyways. Or maybe if they don't have such a high threatening lane, I can be running at them the entire time even though I'm like the shield type hero. The point is recognizing that limit that you have and playing within it. And that's something you'll get better at over time as long as you're thinking about it. And the important thing is to realize in a dual offlane, especially against a tri lane, the worst thing you can do is try to engage at level one because they're all level one and so are you. So if they have more heroes than you, this applies in any lane, honestly, any lane setup. If they have more heroes than you, try to just get CS without them getting denies and establish an XP advantage because they have more heroes sharing XP than you do. If we try to engage at level 1, that's simply 3v2. But if we get level 2 and then engage them as they're all still level 1 because we have 2 heroes and they have 3, that's when you can really punish an advantage from the dual offlane perspective. So I'm just pointing out that, you know, I'm, I don't want to engage them yet. He should know this based on the fact that it's two heroes versus three and they have quite a strong chain stun combination. 
and he should know also where it's coming from. It should be quite predictable when you look at this overall situation between the three heroes versus R2. And yet he continues to stand on this side. The next step, though, is to understand your role as a support in the offlane. Why are you there? So a lot of supports really view their job as, I'm just going to try to kill the safe laner, or the support. I'm just here to kill people. And until this changes, which in the future, even if it does change, this will still apply. You just have to find the proper balance of kills and, and XP. Denies are super powerful currently. Nothing matters more than CSing and interfering with the carries CS. That still applies even if they were to change denies. But right now, that's the only thing that matters in 7.15. So the last thing that should be happening is a support standing in your lane, not hitting anybody or creeps or anything. Deny, harass when the Lycan's going for CS. All of the lessons that we talked about in our coaching simulation course about creep aggro and last hitting and equilibrium, they apply as a support. You can predict when the enemy laner is going to go for a CS and use that for harass, use that for denies, use that for creep aggro to mess with his CS. All these things apply to a support player. And it's super important that if you watch high level supports in the current meta, you can really see what their priorities are in lane. Right now it's denies, maybe in the future, that will change but all these creeps are dying and my leshrac hasn't touched a single creep what is he doing so just like in the creep equilibrium video we talked about if you have six creeps and they have zero that's the perfect time to be aggressive because this early on in the game they can't counterplay you because you have six creeps and they have zero and they're going to be tanking creeps the entire time they go on you so we see six creeps you want to be aggressive because we have six creeps and this guy's level one and we're level two or i'm level two and this guy's almost level two and instead, we're just going to give them free farm under tower, where my Leshrac's leaving me alone. Where I, That's the last thing you want to do in a dual offlane where you're protecting each other. You don't want to leave your carry alone. Why are we not interfering with this Leshrac, or with this Lycan as he's hitting creeps? That's the point, and I just get gone on and die. Where was he that entire time? And you may say, BSJ, you got caught out of position. And the answer is, why isn't he there? Why, why is this Lycan able to hit me and CS when my second hero is not there. The point of the four position in the dual offlane is to distract from your offlaner, just like you would for a carry, and then make them independent as soon as possible. So there's times where you need to realize if your offlaner can be aggressive, enable him to be aggressive. If your offlaner doesn't need your help, don't be in lane taking his experience. And this will change. And what I mean by that is it's not like one game, I don't need your help at all. In the next game, I need you to be aggressive all the time. It's simply constantly recognizing whether or not you can be aggressive or need to be there at all. Are you being defensive? Are you diving to not to kill them, but to be like harass heavy? Or can your offlaner lane without you? And the reason why I mention this is you're going to see it coming up. If your offlaner can lane without your help, don't be there because we talked about the point at the start of this video is your job is to make your offlaner not need your help as soon as possible. The way that a dual offlane can win a game is you establish an advantage for your offlaner, maybe like a slight level advantage or even just give him a decent start and so that he has a good lane and then you leave and snowball the other lanes as well. You don't want to sit here supporting your offlaner. If you stay here too long, I'm sure some of you experience this. You'll get like five kills or you'll like have a strong lane. Meanwhile, your mid lane's losing and your bottom lane's losing. And that's not something we want. It's not worth it to have a lot of pressure on their carry if that means losing your other two lanes. So this is when I told the Leshrac to stand on the left side of the lane while I look to run it. It would have been even better if I'm level three because Omni Knight's heal scales very well. But you're going to see how this is just quite a good combination of harass and damage. How we're creating a lot of space in this lane, but we know how we're going to die, so we play it safe. That was a really hard arrow to land, and he had to reposition himself in order to get it. The point is, if he stands on left, he's not going to get gone on. And if I stand in the middle of the creep wave, it's really hard to arrow me. And notice how now we're fighting together, we're fighting back, and this is what a dual lane should look like. Where we work off of each other's plays. He, I defend him and stand in front, while he sits behind me and does a lot of damage 
And notice how, like, even though my Electrak is messed up, obviously the other team is messing up a lot in coordination. So it's much easier to coordinate two heroes than it is three. And you can use that to your advantage, especially even in lower level pubs. And so we're going to show you again. Like, obviously, it's it's like rinse and repeat. Stop standing on the right side of the lane, Leshrac. That's where Shadow Shaman's going to come from. And he dies again. He should always be behind me or to my left, wherever the lane is. He should always be behind me. So this is an example of if your offlaner is able to get XP under tower, near tower, where you aren't needed to help him, you should not go to lane at that current moment. So we're going to show this part right here, right? Okay, no, he's fine to be in my lane right now because the lane's normal or the lane's like in a spot where it's contested. And notice how we actually predicted that he's going to go for this CS. And this is like Leshrac catching him out of position. We saw the supports mid. So this is a great thing to do if you're an off lane support. If you see the supports going on mid, use that time to immediately punish their carry because you know he's alone. And we actually end up killing him here. And this is a very important time to recognize when you can be aggressive, is when you see the enemy supports not here, even if it's just briefly. That can be just doing a lot of harass, getting like three denies, or killing them. It can be any form of aggression. Same thing again. Notice the trends of when he's dying, standing on the right side of the lane and getting shackled into arrow. So these types of moments as a support are crucial. He TP'd in, possibly helping me with the kill, which is important. It was missed. But do I need him here right now? And the answer is no. This may seem late on in the lane, and this took way longer to happen than it should. But if I'm near my tower, and I'm safe to farm, from the offlaner's perspective as a public service announcement for all of you supports, get the hell out of my lane. If I don't need you, walk away. I don't care if you TP'd here, if you recognize the state of the lane is where I don't need your help, leave. Come back when the lane's, like you don't have to leave permanently. What could he do right now? Every second, just every time you need to leave as the four position, just look at the clock. He could just go stack these two camps, couldn't he? That's what he could do with his time. Instead of sitting here soaking my XP. Come right back, but the lane will shift in terms of whether or not I need your help. Right now, I simply don't. Get out of my lane. I don't want you here. I'm sharing XP with you unnecessarily. And that's the whole point of a dual offlane is to allow your offlaner to be independent without your help. I would even argue that he should come back when I want to push this tower because we can be aggressive together. But it's a little scary if I'm just alone. So there's been a lot of small lessons. And I think the major one that didn't put enough emphasis on is when your offlaner doesn't need your help, whether it's underneath their tower or close to their tower and there's no threat on them. The idea of that is ask yourself how the offlaner is going to die and if your presence in the lane will drastically change that. It's the same concept in the safe lane. It's just in the off lane, it's a little bit different in regards to like how the dynamic of safety and how much they actually need your support. Because most off laners are actually more independent than safe laners. But if they are level one and the carry is level three, that doesn't apply anymore. And that's the purpose of you dual off laning. So there's been a lot of just fundamental things about this video that I really want you guys to understand. And the major thing is you want to leave your off laner as soon as possible. And so make sure you're aggressive when you need to be and make sure you're not in lane when your offlaner doesn't need you. So I'm gonna be doing a brief follow-up to this tips and tricks video, part two of it, with a good example of a dual offlane from a high level support so you can see this done correctly. So for part two of this dual lane video, I'm gonna reiterate some of my main points by bringing up this LGD versus VP game. So some of the main points we brought up about dual lanes is the fact that since they're so prevalent in the current meta, but also I feel like a lot of people misunderstand them, I think it's important to hash out the core components that make up a good dual lane. So first and foremost, we said at the start of the video that you want almost always a ranged hero and a melee hero. So the idea behind this is that the melee hero can serve as like the frontline CSer or like the frontline tank who allows a ranged hero to CS. So you're gonna see in this game between VP versus LGD that the safe lane for LGD is Clockwork Arc Warden. Notice their support duo. They have one ranged, one support, one melee support. And then they have one ranged, one melee core. So that means that they have the melee support with the ranged core. And they have the ranged, core, ranged support with the melee core. 
And on the other hand, you have VP, who has one melee core with a ranged support in the Rubik. But then they also have another melee core who has a ranged support with the Leshrac. This is just a common trend that teams use because the formula, it just works on average. There are exceptions, but almost every time you want one ranged hero, one melee hero, because it just creates the good balance for the laning stage. And you're going to watch, when we watch this top lane, how it's played by both teams. We could watch bottom lane, but this is a game where VP has an incredibly strong dual lane. Nightstalker Lesh is about as bad as it gets for LGD's lineup to deal with, and they are going to lose the lane. But I can only urge you, implore you, to say what would happen if FY is not doing exactly what he's doing to Nine Pasha right now. Nine Pasha would just be running at the Arc Warden. So, like... Even though Arc Warden is a hero that's... All ranged heroes have this natural vulnerability against melee heroes to just get ran at. So if you have two ranged heroes against something like a Night Stalker plus a ranged hero, the Night Stalker is going to spend his entire lane running at you, bodying you away from the CS, and then getting the CS. While on the other hand, if you have two melee heroes against two ranged heroes, those ranged heroes are going to spend like the first creep wave or two kiting you and dealing all the damage in your health, harassing you such that you're going to be like half health, and you can't really fight back after the first wave or two. So finding this happy balance, where you have this frontliner and this ranged hero that sits on the side harassing. Notice how Roger is just sitting on the side back, maybe even messing with some CS, but FY is looking to basically shield Ame from getting dove. That's FY's job. He's putting himself between the two opponents and Ame. He even wraps around trying to threaten them to deter them from diving Ame. He knows his role in the lane is to just serve as this meat shield type hero saying, we're gonna make sure I deter as much aggression on my range core. On the other hand, when you're in the, so this is a defensive version of a dual lane in the safe lane. While on the offensive version, a lot of the times, it's a, like a melee CSer with a ranged hero harassing. Okay, so it's not always the case, but this generally is how it goes. Because if you have a melee core, they'll spend most of their time CSing. And if you have a ranged support, they'll spend most of their time harassing. If you have a melee support and a ranged core, the ranged core is going to spend most of their time CSing, and the melee support is going to spend most of their time playing defensive mode. So that's how the dynamic of dual lanes really need to be set up. And this is like one of those things where if you don't do it and the enemy team does it properly, it's just something you have a very hard time dealing with. For example, I don't even have to pull up this game to show you. I played Nightstalker Windranger offlane, and we were against a Warlock Luna. And if you were to watch this game back, the game ID is on the bottom here, you would see that past the f even like the two minute mark, I am just playing up in the Luna's face, running at her the whole time. And they don't have any hero other than the Undying to deter my aggression. So I think it was a crucial error that the enemy team made to put the Warlock with the Luna and then put the Undying with the DK offlane. Because if you have the Undying top, he can serve as this meat shield, this body that I can't fight through to get to the Luna, but instead they put this Warlock, who, if he tries to stop me from running at the Luna, I'm just gonna kill him instead. So this is like a crucial mistake that loses a pub, in my opinion, for the other team. And so you should try to avoid this as much as possible in your pubs. And when you watch these pro-level dual lanes, just watch it over and over. They, all they do is pick these melee and range combinations, depending on which one's core and which one's support, will matter how you play the lane out. So basically, notice something I haven't commented on, but we're going to rewind to reiterate it, is a lot of questions I've been asked on my stream is, what, how does lane equilibrium tie into dual lanes? So I'm just going to highlight that lane equilibrium doesn't matter for anything in a dual lane. A lot of the time it actually benefits you, to push the lane and you're going to see exactly how vp approaches this most times if you are the aggressive team it benefits you to actually push the lane at the start this gives you two things one you're going to get level two before the opponent and almost every hero in the game of dota 2 is much stronger at level two than they are level one and secondly you're going to get that level two and usually by the third creep wave which means you have level two and they don't because you're, you've killed their two creep waves, and they have not killed yours, the wave's now going to be under their tower. So it sets up this formula where you have level 2, they have level 1, 
and suddenly they're stuck CSing under tower. So notice how VP basically just pushes the lane with Leshrac plus Night Stalker drawing a lot of creep aggro, double up the wave, and then send it underneath LGD's tower when they're both level 2. And then they look to dive, and it makes Ame miss even more CS, right? And even though they are getting XP, that advantage that they established level 1 for the first two creep waves, where they set up this push into the enemy tower, made it so Ame now has one CS after three creep waves have died. And that's just one of those things that I've noticed these teams really capitalizing on. And if you really want to master these dual lanes, you should really pay attention that if you are the aggressor, that you look to shove the lane into their tower by the third creep wave where you have level two and they have level one. And if you're in Ame and FY's position, only thing you can really do is do your best to minimize how many creeps are coming underneath your tower. Giving casual auto attacks to enemy creeps trying to fight back the lane equilibrium as much as possible. But naturally, if you are the weaker lane, this is going to happen to you if the players are good. So really emphasizing to you the, what the team that is ahead or stronger is trying to do, while the team that's behind or weaker is trying to stop from happening. And really the only way to minimize that is all in regards to lane equilibrium. But aside from that, if you are worried about preserving lane equilibrium on either side, that means that you're not drawing any creep aggro, which means you're not harassing. So if one team spends their entire time harassing and dealing damage to you while you're worried about lane equilibrium, who wins, right? And this is a spot where the only reason lane equilibrium matters in the video that I gave you in the coaching simulation course is because you're against this 2v1 or you're against a lane where you have much more threat on them if the lane is back or if the lane is forward, it's detrimental to you in some way. But in dual lanes, you're usually of somewhat equal strength. So all that matters is the CS. All that matters is making sure that you get levels more than they do, and you also get last hits more than they do. So if one team's concerned about the lane equilibrium, while the other team's just spending their time being aggressive, the team that worries about lane equilibrium is under a lot of duress, and they basically don't accomplish anything because who cares about the lane equilibrium if you're behind by 5 CS? That's pretty much what I look at in dual lanes. So, well, you can just play this out for a bit, but you'll notice how after, you know, what we talked about, that's the entire purpose of this lane, is FY puts himself in front, serving as this meat shield, while they look to be aggressive on Arc Warden as much as possible. But look at the way FY's playing. He's just forcing them to deal with him while CS is going on. And this is super important that you realize your role in the lane. And not only is he trying to make them deal with him, but he's also spending most of his time interfering with the Leshrac. Why? Because we talked about Night Stalker is going to spend most of his time CSing, while this range support is going to spend most of their time interfering with your core. So if you know that the range support is going to be the one harassing your safe lane carry, it's most often in your best interest to harass or mess with that range support to keep him out of the picture at least as much as possible and this is a lane where yes vp's matchup is way stronger and they're going to win this lane but notice how neither team first off has put any emphasis on lane equilibrium other than what we talked about with vp diving level one but that's intentionally pushing but aside from that this is a lane where if, if lgd played it any worse than they did where fy wasn't doing all the things he did to mitigate the lead that vp had this lane would have been a complete train wreck and they would have just lost the game from there. And so as the off lane, it's your job to do all the things we mentioned that VP does to try to be as aggressive as possible without, you know, being overly aggressive and dying. But on the side of VP, or on the side of LGD, excuse me, you're just trying to minimize this effect as much as possible and make it so that you can actually recover. Because in this game, where I'm looking at this, in my pub, I use this as the perfect example, they lost this lane so hard, they, they would have lost the lane if they had Undying Luna, but it would have been recoverably lost. Like, they would have had a situation where I wouldn't have just steamrolled the game if the Undying was top. But instead, the Luna never has his time to recover, he's level 3 when I'm like level 5 or 6, and the game, if you lose your safe lane that hard, is just going to be over. So really emphasizing the minimizing of loss if you're the weaker dual lane, and emphasizing the pressuring strength if you're the stronger dual lane and usually last point of the video is that you are the stronger dual lane when you have the melee core range support but that is not always the case so i hope you guys enjoyed this dual lane video we talked about with the pubs mistakes that players make 
and we showed you one example of many that you can find in pro matches where teams um, execute these dual lanes, in my opinion, to the best way that they possibly can.